In December of 1968, three brave astronauts blasted off in what's been called the greatest adventure of all time. Their journey took them higher, faster, and farther than man had ever gone before. They became the first explorers to reach lunar orbit. Well, that Christmas mission proved that man could make it to the moon, and in doing so, they brought peace on Earth. On the 50th anniversary of this historic voyage, we remember the epic story of Apollo 8. To put it mildly, 1968 was a terrible year. Between the riots and the assassinations, the fabric of our nation was being torn apart. Outside our borders, a thousand Americans were being killed in Vietnam every month. Millions more lived under the threat of a nuclear war. At the same time, both the United States and the Russians were engaged in the space race. The Soviets had a big edge. The U.S. needed its best soldiers and scientists for this battle. And Frank Borman, they had both. He was an Air Force fighter pilot who had a master's in aeronautical engineering. In short, the perfect candidate for America's astronaut program. The uh, American effort to catch the Russians in space was going to be a big one. And uh, I had the background, the credentials. So I applied because I was in the military and that was, I was looking for a, an opportunity to serve. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't interested in walking on the moon or picking up rocks. I didn't join because I'm an explorer or an adventurer. My view is it was a serious operation akin to combat and uh, I was there for that reason. While the government needed men like Frank Borman, Frank Borman needed a woman like Susan Bugby. The two married after Frank graduated from West Point. Soon, the fighter pilot and his wife came up with a code. The custard's in the oven at 350, meaning Susan would tend to the household and Frank would worry about the flying. Susan and I had always kidded about that, you know, you got to do the custard and I'll do the flying. She said, look, we're a team. If you want to do it, I'll support you. She really, uh, wanted to, uh, to be a mother and a wife. That was her outlook on life, and uh, she assumed those responsibilities gladly and, and really reveled in them. Even though we were separated a lot, she really raised our boys, and she was always supportive, and, and uh, I don't know what I've done without her. By 1968, astronaut Frank Borman spent 14 days in space and made 206 orbits around the Earth. But by this point, NASA had fallen behind schedule, and all flights were grounded after a fatal fire killed three astronauts. Meanwhile, the Soviets had plans to send men around the moon by the end of the year. America had to act, and act fast. And with time ticking away, NASA decided to throw out the flight plans. They wanted its astronauts around the moon first. And so in the course of one afternoon, they outlined the basic parameters of Apollo 8. Frank Borman was named commander. Astronauts Jim Lovell and Bill Anders rounded out the crew. The date was set, liftoff on December 21st, 1968, giving everyone only a few weeks to train for NASA's riskiest mission. Everybody was determined to win, and they were all motivated. There was no, uh, no slacker, it's, as a matter of fact, I think it was the greatest team this country's ever produced since World War II. As launch day drew near, Bill Landers told his wife there was a 33% chance of a successful mission, 33% chance they'd fail but return home safely, and a 33% chance they wouldn't come back at all. Frank's wife Susan wasn't as optimistic. She was 100% convinced her husband would die on Apollo 8. After the mission, she told me that, but she never told me that before the mission at all. She said, you're the right one to lead it, and, I, and I'll support you 100%. But she didn't have the confidence I did. And I, uh, I guess I just presumed too much that uh, my confidence was uh, infectious. NASA's Jim Webb also brought up another point. Apollo 8 was scheduled to reach the moon on December 24th. 
If they failed, Christmas would be ruined and serve as one final blow to a terrible year. So on December 20th, at around T minus 12 hours until liftoff, Frank Borman knelt down by his bedside to pray. Well, I prayed, of course, the Lord's Prayer, as I've done every night of my life, as long as I can remember. But I also prayed that, uh, basically, that the crew would do a good job. That, because I didn't want to, I didn't want our, we hadn't had a lot of time to train, and I, I didn't want anybody to make a mistake that would endanger the mission. After a sleepless night, Frank and his fellow astronauts suited up and were driven eight miles to launching pad 39A. And on that chilly morning, the three men stood alone before the biggest machine ever built by man. The rocket had 5.6 million parts, 1.5 million systems. And even if they all functioned with 99.9% .9 reliability, that still left the door open for thousands of potential defects, with each one of those carrying the possibility of being a fatal one. If all that weren't enough, consider this. No one had ever flown on one of these before. For Anders, Lovell, and Borman, they all knew the odds were stacked against them. But they didn't flinch. With three brave astronauts 36 stories in the air, the world was watching the final countdown to a mission that few believed would even get off the ground. We're going through a checklist, listening to the ground. 15, 14. You're totally focused on your, on your job. 13, 12. And uh, it was uh, it's just business. 11, 10, 9. Look, I'd like to say that we did some heroic job and we saved them. Actually, everything worked well. At 7.51 a.m. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. First time in history. Four, three. Man was headed to the moon. One, zero. We have commit. We have, we have the drive. At 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think I would describe the, the basic characteristic of the Saturn V launch was noise and uh, a little bit rough, but uh, I don't think our G's got up more than about five and a half or six. Uh, all in all, the Saturn was a, was a wonderful ride. Within a few minutes after liftoff, the Apollo 8 crew had gone higher than anyone had ever gone before. And you know, from standing on the ground, 11 minutes later, you're in orbit. I, I'd like to tell you I'm a poet, and all is wonderful, I'm going to write about it, but, but I, uh, it was uh, interesting. I get, the same, I get the same feeling when I look at the Grand Canyon. This one is smoother. The ship made one and a half orbits around the Earth so Mission Control could check for problems. You are go for TLI, hold it. Two hours later, in the expanse of space, the crew experienced a bit of a hiccup. Although, truth be told, a bit more than a hiccup. I got nauseated, and uh, I uh, couldn't contain it all, so I just went everywhere. But Lovell and Anders also told me that they got nauseated too, but they didn't uh, throw up the way I did. I, I still get kidding. <laughs> For the better part of half a day, Frank battled with the urge to throw up and actually doing so. While NASA mulled over canceling the mission, the astronauts said that was out of the question. They'd all worked too hard and come too far to turn back. That's nonsense. Boarding the mission because you have a, a no, no, I, I can't see aborting the, aborting the mission for only the most dire reason. Frank fought through his illness and Apollo 8 continued on. By the 55 hour marker of the flight, Apollo 8 started to be reeled in by the moon's gravity. The crew was now falling upwards towards the lunar surface and the most harrowing part of their mission. In order to enter lunar orbit, the astronauts had to hit a narrow point just 69 miles above the moon's surface. And just to underscore how mathematically complicated that is, pretend this apple is the moon. Hitting the exact right trajectory would be the equivalent of throwing a dart at this apple from 28 feet away and just grazing the skin. And by the way, this apple is traveling at 2,300 miles an hour. 
If the calculations were off just a fraction of a degree, the astronauts could be lost in space forever or crash right into the moon's surface. And one more thing, this complicated maneuver had to happen in radio silence. You entered the lunar orbit when you were behind the moon, so there was no communication with the Earth. Before loss of signal, NASA passed on a message from Frank's wife who wanted him to know the custards in the oven at 350. And I didn't, uh, I didn't connect with it right off the bat until, until she obviously did. And she wanted to re re reassure me that uh, everything was home, at home was OK. Thanks a lot, Trips. We'll see you on the other side. As Susan Borman waited by the squawk box, the crew was 240,000 miles away. There, alone and upside down, the astronauts became the first men to ever lay eyes on the barren landscape of the far side of the moon. The time, a few minutes before 5 a.m. on December 24th, Christmas Eve. We looked down and the lunar surface was uh, just different shades of gray and black and white. Looks like a sand pile. My kids have been playing in for a long time. There were all kinds of, uh, of uh, craters and uh, volcanic, ex you know, extinct volcan. It was a very distressed place. Shortly after spotting the moon, the crew fired their rockets to make sure they weren't going too fast or too slow for lunar orbit. Four months of planning came down to this, the crew's fate in the hands of calculations from a bunch of kids fresh out of college. I think the average age was something like 24, and they were wonderful people. They were dedicated, they were confident. Very few of them out of what you would call elite schools. I don't think there was one Ivy Leaguer in the whole bunch and they did the job right every time. The whiz kids were spot on, and a little more than a half hour later, Mission Control regained contact with the ship. And while the Earth exhaled, the astronauts still had a job to do. They had to make 10 orbits around the moon to scout out potential landing sites for future missions. For hours upon hours, they photographed the arid terrain. And on the fourth pass across the arc of the lunar horizon, Bill Anders spotted something that changed the world. Oh, my God, look at that picture over there. And we looked up, and there in the background was the, the only object in the entire universe that had any color. Wow, is that pretty? And here we are a long way from home, and this beautiful blue marble is floating back there 240,000 miles away. You got a phrase it's very clear right here. You gotta remember, this was the Christmas season. I'm, I can't again speak for how Jim and Bill felt, but I was uh, nostalgic. I missed my family. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. And when you look back and realize that uh, the Earth is really alone in the universe, it, it made me realize, at least, that uh, we better do a good job of taking care of it. Take your civil, take your civil. Here, let me just get the right setting here. Hey, calm down, Mama. Secondarily, is. Why can't we get along a little better? At that moment, Anders captured a photo that has since been called Earthrise. Time Magazine later said in a war-torn year, it captured the beauty and fragility of our home planet. Back at home, families were gathered around to celebrate Christmas Eve and watch Apollo's progress. It's estimated that a billion people were tuned in to the Apollo 8 Christmas Eve broadcast. And to the largest audience in human history, the astronauts had a message for all mankind. How about now, uh, Apollo? Loud and clear. When we were told that we'd have the largest time, the Jim and Bill and I tried to focus on what was appropriate. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. And we came up with all kinds of things. The vast loneliness up here on the moon awe-inspiring. Some of them kind of silly about Christmas and so on, and it was very difficult. It makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. So I asked a friend of mine, and he couldn't come up with anything. Apollo 8, uh, we've apparently lost your voice. The picture is so good. So we had a friend that he trusted. He spent one whole night and had nothing but crumpled up note paper. Couldn't figure out anything either. And it was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, his wife came walking down the stairs and said, Joe, what in the world are you doing? And she, he said, explain what you're doing. And she said, well, why don't you just start in the beginning? And uh, he said, what do you mean? He said, Genesis. For all the people 
Back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. As soon as it was suggested to us, all three of us said, why didn't we think of that? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The crew read from the book of Genesis, 10 verses, straight from the creation story. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I think we were trying to convey the fact that it wasn't just all happenstance, that there was a power behind the, the world and behind our behind life that gave it meaning. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. It was a very rewarding feeling for me that uh, here we were in a country that uh, that felt that way. And God called the dry land earth. Now, can you imagine that happening today? Or can you imagine if that had been a Russian up there? And we'd have heard about Lenin and Stalin and communists. And all they told us was to do something appropriate. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Christmas Day arrived a few hours later, and with it, time to come home. As the astronauts reflected on the holiday at the moon, Anders deadpanned he hoped he wouldn't be spending New Year's there as well. The concern was real. If the engines failed to fire, the crew would be stuck in lunar orbit forever. With this on his mind, Anders left behind two tapes for his children, one to be played later that morning for Christmas, one to be played if it was clear he wasn't coming home at all. Meanwhile, Susan Borman began writing her husband's eulogy. And, and I never looked at that way. At that way, I, I felt we were, with absolute certainty, that we were going to be, we'd come back. As Susan sat at her kitchen table, the Apollo 8 crew was in radio silence. Apollo 8, Houston. Finally, at 12:25 a.m. Christmas morning, Jim Lovell's voice crackled through the speakers. We got the confirmation that we were, we were on a perfect trajectory. Uh, it was one of uh, great satisfaction. Roger. Please be informed there is a Santa Claus. And the fact that it all worked well, we all thought it would work well, but it did work well. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a great moment. At long last, the Apollo 8 crew was on its way home, a final quarter million miles to conclude history's longest holiday trip. And before long, to the garbled tune of Oh Holy Night, the sleepy crew was getting ready for re-entry. Back at home in the Borman household, presents would have to wait. Susan refused to open anything until she could do so with her husband. Instead, she took her boys to church. And there, the reverend prayed for the benefit of one member of the congregation that the God of time and space watch over and protect the astronauts of our country. Shortly after, thousands upon thousands of miles away, the exhausted crew tried getting some much needed rest when a tired a Jim Lovell punched a wrong button. The spacecraft oriented to what it thought was the uh, launch position, and so we had a mess there for a while. The ship was, in essence, flying blind. I'm gonna defend Jim, because that was one part of the software that should have been protected. You should have had to have a, a pin or something before you got to that part of the memory. After putting in the coordinates and some good-natured ribbing, Apollo 8 continued on. I wouldn't let him, I wouldn't let him forget it either. You know, what the dickens? <laughs> that was, I never even thought about it. We fixed it up and it was fine. I told Michael you guys are up there and he said, who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Duke's doing most of the driving right now. And with Isaac Newton in the driver's seat, Apollo 8 picked up speed. Soon they were racing home 10 times faster than a bullet fired from a rifle. And on the morning of December 27th, the crew was given the go for re-entry. Everything's looking good. First place, you had to uh, relieve an, an enormous thermal load on the spacecraft. That meant jetting the service module, 
Now all that was left of the massive Saturn V rocket was a 10-foot cone. And you come into this, the atmosphere uh, at a very shallow but a the definite down angle. This angle had to be precise. Too shallow, and the crew would skip off the Earth. Too deep, and they'd be incinerated. And like many other parts of this mission, this had never been done before. As a matter of fact, I don't think it had really had a successful uh, or, or a complete test of that even on that. But again, it worked perfectly. The Earth's atmosphere would slow the ship down, but there was a trade-off. It would generate heat. Just outside the spacecraft, a few feet from the astronauts' faces, temperatures rose to 5,000 degrees, half that of the surface of the sun. With the added heat came added pressure. In this case, six times the weight of gravity. When you take those kind of Gs, your eyes flatten out, so you get tunnel vision you know, looking like this. Uh, it's hard to breathe. It feels like you have an elephant sitting on your chest. Hang on. But when you pull six Gs for six minutes, it becomes a little more interesting. <laughs> so uh, toward the end of the, of the six minutes, uh, I think we were all huffing and puffing. As the G-forces pressed on the astronauts, Anders saw baseball-sized chunks of the heat shield flying away. Later on, he found out that, that the baseball-sized ones he found were really about the eighth of an inch in diameter. By this point, the entire ship was like a manned comet. One Pan Am pilot saw the craft and estimated its fiery tail to be 100 miles long. At 40,000 feet, the astronauts were hurtling to the Pacific at 680 miles an hour. And NASA could only hope the crew was on the right trajectory. Ken Mattingly just put in a call, and he's gotten no responses yet. And then, Houston, Apollo 8, over. a parachute deployed, and another, and the ship softly glided down to the ocean. At exactly 4.51 local on December 27th, right on its scheduled time and location, the ship splashed down into the waters. 147 hours after blastoff, the Apollo 8 crew was back home. I'd like to tell you that it, well, I flew it perfectly, but because I am the world, I was the world's best. I may still be the world's best pilot, but nevertheless, it was all on the autopilot. Inside the cramped quarters of the command module, while waiting for the rescue crew, bobbing up and down in the middle of the ocean, once again, Frank Borman barfed. This time I aimed at Lovell and Andrews because they were giving me a hard time. <laughs> Aboard the USS Yorktown, the three astronauts received a hero's welcome. Stepping out on a carrier after a successful mission with all the work and effort that had gone into it, not just by the crew, but by all the Americans involved, was a very, very gratifying moment. I was, uh, I was almost overwhelmed with, uh, with gratitude. The New York Times celebrated the Apollo 8 mission as the most fantastic journey of all time. The Washington Evening Star said man's horizon now reaches to infinity. It felt wonderful. We'd done the job. We were back on Earth. I was going to see my family in a few hours. I mean, it's a high point of, the, of your life, really. The Apollo 8 journey proved man could make it to the moon. And minutes after arriving home, Frank Borman who joined NASA to help America fight the Cold War, was getting congratulated by the President of the United States. Well, I'd like to tell you it made me feel wonderful and it was this and that and grand, but to be honest with you, I never thought a thing about it. I was extremely proud of the fact that we had done our job and the mission was successful, and we beat the Russians. For their part, the Russians never reached the moon, and after their defeat in the space race, they stopped trying. The Soviets said they hoped Apollo 8 would open the door to more cooperation between them and the United States. That dream came true, and even today, Russian cosmonauts and Americans work side by side. I think we contributed to winning the Cold War. I think that was the, uh, an important factor in winning the Cold War. The reading of Genesis would go down in lore, and the Pope himself later remarked, in that moment, the world had peace. I think that had more impact than anything else. But how am I to know? I was on board. I, I wasn't, I, just from what I've read since. Prior to Apollo 8's successful mission, Time Magazine was going to name The Dissenter as its Men of the Year. 
But after the astronauts returned home, Bill Anders, Jim Lovell, and Frank Borman were given the honor instead. And we got, of course, thousands of uh, telegrams, but the one that was, the only one I remember, to be honest with you, it said, congratulations, you saved 1968. The following July, Neil Armstrong took mankind's first steps on the lunar surface. He did so in the Sea of Tranquility, an area Bill Anders photographed as a potential landing site on Apollo 8. Anders left NASA after the moon landing and held a variety of government jobs before moving into the private sector. He and his wife, Valerie, are now retired and live in Washington State. Jim Lovell was Neil Armstrong's backup on Apollo 11. Later, he was the commander of the ill-fated Apollo 13. It's said the navigational skills he honed under pressure during Apollo 8 helped save the lives of himself and his crew members on 13. Lovell never flew again after that, and for his service, he was awarded both the Congressional Space Medal of Honor and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He and his wife, Marilyn, live near Chicago, near the science museum that now houses the command module from Apollo 8. The rumor around NASA was that Frank Borman was the first choice to be the first man to walk on the moon. And when Neil Armstrong was chosen instead, Frank was relieved. He didn't want to put Susan through the stresses of a longer and even harder mission. Once we had done our job, I felt that we had uh had done our job, and so I left. And with his Cold War complete, Frank Borman went on to be the CEO of Eastern Airlines before retiring to a ranch in Montana. Still, the Apollo 8 mission is fresh on his mind. When well, the astronaut, 400,000 Americans made it happen, the taxpayers made it happen. It was a wonderful demonstration of what this country can do when it finally pulls together in one direction because it was one time where people were able to put the objective before everything else. The mission was more important to the people in Apollo and uh, NASA than anything else. And after a lifetime of watching his family sacrifice so he could serve his country, Frank is repaying the favor. 10 years ago, Susan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And every morning, Frank is by her side. I can't tell you about love most of She just has been a, a wonderful partner and friend. She's the most unselfish person I've ever known in my life. Uh, it, uh, I was very, very fortunate. 50 years after Apollo 8 and 240,000 miles from the moon, Frank Borman has embarked on his final mission, his greatest one yet. You hope for the best and uh, trust in the Lord.